Richardson. I'm managing director with the Open Textbook Network. We are a community of institutions working together on open education, including open textbook publishing. And we too are delighted to partner with Rebus Community on office hours and other issues in this space. Um, and um, office hours are monthly sessions. If you haven't been to one before, it's pretty informal. Um, we'll have uh, guests introduce themselves for a few minutes and then chat uh, together. And um, if there are things that you would like to explore in future topics, this is a great time to let us know. Put your suggestions in the chat, let us know what's on your mind. And then the one other thing I'll say is that I'm sure in addition to our three guests, there are many people who have joined the call who also have a lot of great experience and can um, bring a lot to the conversation. So I look forward to hearing from many of you today. Excellent, thanks Karen. So today we're kind of expanding our reach a little bit with our topic. So we, we, our focus is typically on open textbooks. Today we're also bringing in uh, monographs and journals as other kinds of uh, publishing that happens. And, and as it happens, we do also have uh, one of our guests who will speak very, um, very clearly through open publishing of monographs and journals as well, which is kind of a nice alignment with what we work. Uh, work with typically. And so these three areas, they obviously, they all live within the same sort of area in, in academic publishing, and they're fundamentally really about sharing knowledge. Uh, so do have a lot in common, but in forms of the actual, in terms of the actual publishing processes, they are also really different in some interesting ways. And so that's kind of what we want to explore today. Uh, think about how they are the same, how they differ, um, and then hopefully use that knowledge to kind of really build understanding of all different kinds of publishing and, and for many of you here, if your interest is open, in open textbooks, uh, understanding how that process can compare to others um, can be a really good tool for, uh, for talking to faculty who are more familiar with others uh, or if you yourselves are kind of new to this field or, or interested in, uh, in exploring open textbook publishing in itself. Uh, we think this is a nice kind of chance to contrast those. And so we have three fantastic guest speakers with us today uh, who can speak to a few different uh, approaches to this topic. Um, so first off, we will hear from uh, Danielle Meachelva, uh, who is uh, the course chair and adjunct associate professor at the University of Maryland University College. Um, followed by that, we're joined by Chelsea Bowley, who is the community manager at Ubiquity Press. Uh, and then following that, we have David Allen Rick, who is the president and CEO at Scribe. So we'll uh, run through those guests in their, in their order. They'll speak for a few minutes about their work and then we'll get into questions and, uh, and hopefully hear from uh, many of you as well um, about this, uh, this great topic. So Danielle, I'll hand over to you, thanks. Okay, um, so, whoops, sorry. Oh, you, you unmuted me, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Ms. Perva. Um, so uh, to let you know, I, I've um, published the traditional route and then also um, I've done an open access monograph. Um, I, it was a co-translation that I did with a colleague um, with the uh, digital press at the University of North Dakota. And then now I'm working on a collaborative project. It's an open access textbook. So. Um, Going to be talking about my experience with both of those things. I'm not sure how uh, well clarified all this is, so just feel free to ask questions. And I'm going to read my comments because I tend towards tangents. So, so I have two quotes for you. One is an old military dictum, and the other is from Jack London's Sea Wolf. First, Jack London: Expect all hell to break loose, but don't mind it. Yours is to do your own work. Second, the military dictum. Planning replaces chaos with error. These two quotes characterize my open access publishing experience as a translator and as an editor. My role as an editor is really also as publisher because in the open access world, it's all volunteer work. So it's, it's all hands on deck. So, and even as a translator, I did a lot of the, the publishing uh, side of the, the work. Most open access publishers are not publishers, they're scholars with an altruistic vision of access. They're doing what they believe needs doing, but this does not mean they know how to do it. We're all learning as we go, and this is where Rebus comes in, offering a place to share best practices as well as the things that don't work. So my experience as a translator was simply hearing about and witnessing 
the process of the publisher learning how to do something that hadn't been done before. The, the digital press really was um, fairly cutting edge. I think it was among the early um, open access publishers out there. And so he was really kind of feeling his way in the dark. This is a colleague of mine. Um, back to Jack London and the, uh, the well, I, I wanted to say, uh, so this made things slow and makeshift but also cooperative and collaborative, which was really exciting, much more so in the, than, than in the traditional publishing world. So back to Jack London and the military dictum, expect all hell to break loose, uh, but don't you mind it. Yours is to do your own work and planning replaces chaos with error. I really do mean these things. So in the textbook, in textbook publishing, in the open access world, in terms of planning, it really does help. Write out a formal press C, for example. Um, you can find ours in the Rebus community and download it and use it as a template. Create spreadsheets to manage people's tasks and workflow. Write an author guide and peer review guidelines. Do as much of this beforehand as you can and use it. Borrow ours. Our stuff is out there um, on, on the Rebus community site. So be prepared to adjust things and see these documents as living, as living documents. They will eliminate many errors and that will be very helpful. Also the process of writing these documents out will help you define and refine your plans which will reduce the chaos. There will still probably be chaos, especially if you're dealing with multiple authors. If you're dealing with just one or two, like with a monograph, I don't think the chaos, I'm, I'm not sure there really is chaos, but when you're dealing with lots of people, um, it's, it's uh, a little chaotic. Anyway, I call my textbook affectionately my, uh, or our textbook, I should say, my 56 armed pet octopus. So to deal with the chaos, of all hell breaking loose and causing other projects to be delayed, you have to figure out what your work is. Define for people on your team, including yourself, what their roles are precisely. For example, I thought I would do a fair amount of the writing in this textbook, but I simply can't manage to contribute content while managing workflow. There's a reason project manager is a full-time job in most organizations. And it turns out that my work as an executive editor of an open access textbook is not to contribute as I would to a volume of scholarly articles that I might edit in the traditional world. My role as an open access editor is project manager, consensus builder, decision maker, guideline template and agreement writer, and in many ways publisher. You know, you, 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 um, I'm working uh, in partnership with our publisher, but I found the, uh, the cover designer, I approved all the proofs and I, you know, you go through that process and you end up doing much of it yourself, or at least that's my experience. So when you figure out what your role is, let others or ask others to do the things that you can't. So I'm not writing the introduction, which felt like a source of shame and failure, but it's not. Frankly, there's someone on, on, the, on the team that's much better qualified than I am. This is his area of expertise where it's, it's not really mine. Nothing has gone the way I expected it to, but bi-weekly meetings with Rebus uh, have really helped in terms of um, the constant readjustment of process. So be sure to use the documents in the Rebus community and use the templates for contracts and recruiting letters. Those are wonderful. Um, and I think it's easier if you have just one or two writers uh, rather than um, a whole, I, I, we, I don't, I think we have 50 authors if I remember correctly. It's very hard to keep uh, track of the, the flow and who is where and who's doing what. So I'll stop there and look forward to hearing others experience. And Wonderful, thank you, Danielle. Uh, and your kind words, I swear we didn't put her up to it, uh, but we've had a, a, a wonderful experience working together on, on your project and, and learned a lot from it. I think you really identified some of the key, key things there. Uh, great, so now I will hand over to Chelsea from Ubiquity Press. Hi everyone, um, so as, as Zoe noted earlier, I'm the community manager for Ubiquity Press. Um, some days I'm still figuring out what that means. Um, I don't get to work directly with the publishing um, a cycle and I'm much more internal and external community management. Um, 
a big project I've been working on the past year has been um, getting governance in order to better uh, address community issues. Um, but uh, regarding this topic, um, my introduction um, to open ed, um, which I didn't know at the time that's what it was, um, was uh, coming in fall 2012 when I uh, began a graduate assistantship um, in scholarly communication um, during library school. I um, are in the floor at the time. This was Florida State University. Um, the top item in the repository was a effectively a textbook, um, but it was just a PDF that was added. Uh, my psychologist, psychologist who had tenure, decided to write a how-to guide to have a better dissertation. Um, he could have released it as a textbook, uh, maybe a little, little bit of funds, but instead he released it under a Creative Commons license. At the most downloaded rep uh, repository item with views around the world. It was amazing to see that impact. Um, and I didn't know at the time, but that was OER. Um, and that was something that was on a more traditional line with a graduate student audience that could have um, been published in a more traditional fashion. And I was so great to see that impact of that piece. Um, but fast forwarding to today, um, Ubiquity Press, um, uh, I, I liked what Danielle said about most open access publishers are not publishers or scholars. Um, a lot of individuals who are choosing to make their monographs or textbooks open often are just scholars who want to share um, openly and contribute um, to a stronger public good. Um, and which on a personal uh, belief system that that's that's exactly what I would want to do. Um, uh, Ubiquity was founded um, by PhD students who wanted more affordable open access publishing options um, since they were trying to launch a journal. And uh, that's really where the root is um, about wanting to make it cost effective. Um, we publish uh, primarily open access journals and books um, are starting to get into OER. Um, as many of you probably already know, but if you don't know, I'll go ahead and plug uh, uh, the, the book that uh, Rajiv co-edited, open, um, put the link in there. If you haven't uh, read it and you're someone who's working in the space or new to the space, um, I do think it's a, it's a must read. I am apparently sending to just privately to Michelle, um, don't know how that happened, um, resending that link. Um, and, uh, but, uh, one uh, recent um, uh, OER type uh, creation I want to highlight is actually from one of our partner presses. Um, uh, Ubiquity operates on a model. We publish our books and journals ourselves as well, but we also just provide hosting solutions to others and it's fully branded with that partner press. Um, and uh, Virginia Tech um, is one of those partner presses um, and they joined last year um, and they recently created a uh, student and um, professor co-authored collection um, uh, or co-edited rather collection about the Beatles um, and I think this is uh, a it follows a more traditional way of how someone would have published a, a collection but with um, uh, the engagement of students helping to create this um, which I think can really take away um, uh, oh thanks Rajiv um, uh, uh, his comment about plugging um, another um, resource there. Uh, that really takes away, I think, the curtain of how publishing works. Um, I, I Especially for, for uh, people that are intending to go into graduate school, already are, or wanting to stay in academia. Uh, every time I explain how publishing works uh, to someone outside of the space, they're shocked. I remember the first time I was sat across um, and explained it uh, as um, a, an early grad student um, and shocked. And I think you can really take away the curtain by involving students that way, um, getting them to participate in their own um, learning, creating materials. Um, but uh, overall, uh, there, there, is, there can be no difference sometimes with uh, publishing an open education resource um, besides making it available at the end. Um, all but on the other hand, as like Danielle noted, these, these can be living documents and they can change and grow and that's where I think things get a lot different. Um, but if one is pr preparing a more traditional textbook in the sense of it, it resembles more of a book rather than um, uh, a, a courseware which might be open, 
um, like a MOOC or um, are uh, creating videos alongside it, different pieces or digital humanities kind of project. That's when things get definitely non-traditional. Um, but uh, really we can maintain a lot of our similar practices on um, the way we work. Um, it's just about that endpoint and what gets open. Um, and so open monographs, um, which is a huge portion of what we publish, um, may not be applicable to necessarily open education materials for an undergraduate level, but could be great for graduate students um, uh, who are also um, uh, ha have less open, open access um, resources there. And uh, so that's an area I also want to see grow and just really more open scholarship in general. Um, uh, but overall, I do think that di there's not as much difference, but really about who your audience is and um, what one's end goal is. Um, but uh, definitely always um, increasing the amount of readers um, is the, the end result there. So, um, and happy to discuss any, any questions about um, how, how that works. Um, uh, I think the most important concept when it comes to when I try to talk about ubiquity is that um, a lot of people view open access publishing as extremely expensive. Um, and I, a lot of this comes down to the traditional article processing charge we're seeing at $3,000 levels. Um, and it is definitely possible to publish way less. Um, our average article processing charge hovers just under $600 right now. Um, across our journals, but also it's entirely possible for a university to spend a reasonable amount, especially when we're considering what it costs to subscribe to journals, uh, to really support the really strong initiatives, um, especially since so many faculty are putting, open is never free, um, there's still like whether it's volunteer label, right? Um, but uh, I think there's a lot of ways that we can make uh, things more equitable and affordable and uh, take away um, uh, that that curtain over how open publishing works. Wonderful, thanks Chelsea. I love that image as well of actually, you know, making the invisible visible. That's something we chat about a bit and, and how this is a kind of an amazing opportunity we have to do that, to make publishing a really visible process and, and service of this goal that we all share with all kinds of different materials. Excellent, thanks so much. Uh, and now I will pass over to David. Chelsea, by the way, are you? Did you say Florida State? Yeah, did I, went I catch to, that correctly? You did. Um, I went to. Okay, I'm changing my profile picture <laughs> then. I spent you. one year for graduate school at Florida State. Um, okay. So I have no. I'm sorry, but that's okay. <laughs> I hope we can. You, know, you can forgive me. I have no allegiance to the Knowles, though. Um, so. No, no, I'm only kidding. So, um, so to augment what Danielle said, it's interesting because whenever uh, we get people involved in publishing here at Scribe, what I try to do is kind of scare them off a bit. I, I don't know if I would actually scare them off, but I differentiate between long and short format in publishing. And by short format publishing, what I mean is journals, smaller publications, which are very deadline driven and often there's a lot of frenetic activity and to augment the planning replaces chaos with er with error, the one thing is, is that in long format publishing, that is books, especially textbooks, the ample amount of time and working according to a natural schedule as opposed to an imposed one like a semester deadline or something like that is probably the best thing I can tell you needs to be done. So uh, I just pasted into the chat a list. So whoever wrote the introduction to this session wrote each of these, uh, the, they broadly consist of acquisition, creation, that is writing and editing, review, format, and release. I just wanted to augment that a bit, which is that I would call it something different, I would say they all have what we re should refer to as acquisition. That is the idea of the textbook and they should all have a very strong book proposal with a listing of all the elements, if not as much writing material as possible. In, in terms of planning, one of the things about textbooks that I'll get to in a few seconds is the audience is different and therefore the, act, the process of acquisition 
has to be not this guy or woman knows what she's doing, but this is what we're trying to accomplish and this is how we are going to accomplish it in a book. Then there's always developmental editing process, which is a dialectic process that occurs between the editor or editors, the author, including peer review, because people will have comments back and forth. And before something is cleaned up for copy editing or formatted, you really need to solidify the developmental editing process and make sure that the entire textbook is done. We've been running textbooks for a very long time, and any time that someone holds off on an element or they say, oh, we'll get to that later, that creates absolute chaos and error, by the way, not, not, not either. Um, and so what we suggest is that you be careful in the developmental editing stage to do what we call solidify the manuscript. Then, of course, there's copy editing. And a big difference in textbook editing versus other types, especially monograph, is that copy editors are not only looking for syntax and grammatical issues, spelling and punctuation issues, as well as consistency issues. They tend to need to be alert to usage of terminology and marking out first use of things, especially specific terms. They also should be pedagogically aware, that is understand how things will come across, because sometimes where the order of something would read okay, for pedagogical purposes, you may have to shift that around and only a conscious editor is aware of that. Um, typesetting and formatting for these things should be done not according to a traditional aesthetic or this is a nice font or we really like this. It really should consider the way people read, especially in both print and electronic, and be attentive to how we comprehend and how we digest information, and that things that are traditional in books, like ancillaries or other kinds of components like images, often may distract. The proofreading stage is pretty much the same, except that you can't do a cold proofread in a textbook. What you have to do is an informed proofread that is done in conjunction with the copy editor and developmental editor so that the proofreader is not only reading cold, but also reading according to the pedagogic and structural needs of the textbook. Occasionally, you'll do an index, and, and at that point, it's very important to engage the authors more than just normal, not to have strictly a traditionally created index, but one that is pedagogically sound and fits the use. And of course, print and electronic output. Um, and what is really important, what we like to stress, is that the biggest difference between textbooks and other types of publications is the audience. Textbooks are produced by people who are subject matter experts. They're used to a particular rhetoric. They're used to particular vocabulary. And they are fully entrenched in the subject. So when they are writing and creating, the familiarity with the subject is assumed and the language is established. And what is expected is that they're augmenting an already existing body of knowledge. And things like notes and bibliographies are there to add to that augmentation. With respect to textbooks, what, what people are dealing with are neophytes. And they're subject matter neophytes, although that's a redundancy in terminology. And, and so what we're trying to do is, is introduce people to generally accepted elements on a particular subject, thus the review, in a way that allows them to synthesize that with their already extant body of knowledge. Thus, it needs to be more generically educational. Um, and usually, as they're considered to be a supplement to an instructional process, so you have to kind of be very aware of what that instructional process is in terms of the order of instruction, the way things are divided and arranged in a classroom setting, or even just things like how examinations are provided and what kind of review and kind of use that the textbook will have. Um, and again, 
textbooks assume a lack of knowledge, so they have to be introductory and provide additional methods to synthesize information. So things like common use of the same term as opposed to sub substituting synonyms or providing summaries or indices or glossaries, those elements are very important and should be considered in the proposal. Um, the other thing is that we need to be attentive to the fact that people learn in different ways and that learning methods, structure, accessibility, comprehension have to be the primary focus in addition, of course, to the subject being conveyed. And that key to that is not only the writing, but the editorial and design methods that are applied. Um, and again, I'm gonna just repeat one thing. The worst enemy we have a joke in sailing, which is that the worst enemy to a sailor is a schedule. And that often is the case with textbooks. You want to have a loose a schedule where you know what the end date is, but you never want to have an unnatural one where you end up with Daniel's chaos and, and, and error as well. That's it for me. Wonderful. Thanks, David. Uh, Appreciate eating on the metaphor. And I also, I love what you say about the assumed knowledge. I think that's a really, really important distinction. Uh, so now, having heard from our guests, thank you so much. I think they've raised some really, really interesting points. We'll kind of open it up. Uh, Karen, did you want to get us started? Well, I would just like to add um, one of the reasons that we invited Dave into the session is because Scribe is a partner with the Open Textbook Network in the Publishing Cooperative. And so we've been working together for more than a year on developing shared processes and expertise in textbook development together and um, really appreciate his, um, his background and his staff and their expert knowledge. I'm just going to put a link um, about Scribe in the chat. Great. Thanks, Karen. So. Uh, yes, and thank you, Karen. Uh, if anybody has questions or would like to share their own experiences, now's kind of the time to, uh, to chime in. Um, I may pick on uh, somebody if we don't get any, but I'll give a couple of moments if you want to gather thoughts and, and ask any questions. Okay, maybe people are typing away, but I, uh, I may actually ask Rajiv if maybe he has some thoughts. And being someone on the call, we've just seen who produced uh, the wonderful monograph from Ubiquity, which I agree, we, we read that a lot here as well. Um, and uh, is obviously also very experienced with textbooks. So I wonder if you have any reflections on that, on what our guests have shared so far, Rajiv. And sorry for putting you on the spot. Yeah, no, that's totally fine. Um, it's an interesting space, I think, as, as uh, someone working um, within my discipline to approach this, uh, both from an open access publishing point of view and then the open textbook uh, uh, side. And I think one of the things that strikes me as, as an academic uh, is just the very different cultures and the very different norms in those two different categories uh, that are heavily influencing, I, I think, uh, some of the support that's necessary and often some of the education uh, and some of the myth busting misconceptions that need to be dealt with out of the gate. Um, still the equating of open access with, uh, you know, predatory publishing. Thanks very much, Beal, for that. Um, you know, <laughs> a number of issues like that. Uh, but I think um, the opportunities on, on, on the flip side is, is sort of um, to be a bit subversive, to, to uh, take advantage of what does matter uh, when we're moving ahead. So yeah, whether it's citation counts that matter or something else, getting people into the gate. Uh, one of the things I'm sort of interested in, in getting uh, so I was really interested in, in David when you were sort of uh, augmenting the initial list, uh, especially. Uh, it's one of the things we are building over here is with, even though we have a number of open textbook authors at KPU, we're trying to get to a point where we are requiring less of our faculty authors. So for example, uh, if they want to use uh, and learn how to use Pressbooks, embed H5P, all of that fun stuff, fantastic. But if they don't, uh, we want to be able to essentially meet them where they are. And so if they come to us with a long word document saying, here's my stuff, do what you need to do uh, and, and, and magically convert it into an open textbook, we're trying to get to a point where we can meet them where they are. And so um, I appreciate the, 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 the advice about book proposals. 
And I'm sort of looking also to think about how I can calibrate that for situations where it's not really a traditional sort of, uh, like I approached ubiquity with a book proposal, but it's something less than that. And how we can sort of uh, meet people where they are and still extract the bits that we need to sort of manage the process after that, if that makes sense at all. Do you mind if I come in on that? So, uh, so when I say a formal book proposal, I do not mean that an author needs to have that formal book proposal. But uh, so let me define book proposal the way I use it internally here at Scribe. We don't call them proposals; we call them statements of work. And you can meet an author where she is, right, and say, "Hey, look, this is what you have." But there has to be, before even starting the editorial and review process, I would argue that you really need to think through what the structure of the book is and create a statement of work and a book architecture. And you may, at, after, decide, well, that element is going to change because review suggests that we need to do something different or, you know, whatever. But at the end of the day, if you try to like just take what someone gives you, authors who are not professional publishers tend not to understand the, the complex elements and how everything fits together. And you end up trying to dig yourself out of a hole throughout the entire process. I think as well I heard something in what Rajiv was saying that links back to where Danielle started us off and that I, I think more and more uh, people are recognizing the amount of work that goes into this from the faculty and how it has been on, on uh, editors and authors like Danielle to figure it out and, and kind of do all that work themselves and it's exciting to start seeing some of these models emerge that are, are supporting that more and kind of taking some of that onus off of the, the people who are driven to, to do the creation. Um, in some interesting ways. Anybody else have questions for, uh, for our guests? Uh, thanks, Rajiv. Uh, you just shared the uh, BC Campus self-publishing guide, which is a, a great resource for, for authors who are setting out into, into the space. Anybody else feel like chiming in with their own experiences? It's a quiet bunch today. <laughs> well, I would be interested in our, in our guest take on developmental editing. It's something that David talked about and Danielle and your role um, you're probably involved with. And so uh, maybe we can just surface a little bit more of what's involved in developmental editing. Um, especially since we're looking at some of the similarities and differences between monographs, journals, and textbooks, um, just thinking about the process of putting those together, um, or as Rebel said in the chat, other lessons learned related to developmental or editing or other things, um, barriers that are still around that we're working on. And I think, it, I think too, you know, there are so many different ways to, to, to do things depending on what, what your expectations are um, for the output, what's going to meet the needs of your students or your readers. And so we're having a very wide ranging conversation about a variety of outputs, I think, um, and a variety of audiences. And so sometimes I think connecting the threads amongst all of those um, uh, can be a challenge. So we have, we have a question from Rebel. Um, in the chat or <clears throat> my question about developmental editing for any anyone who wants to explore it. I would uh, answer quickly um, Rebel's question. Uh, I think one of the things that is the most time consuming uh, is something that Aperva and I have talked about trying to find a way to automate and that's following up with authors, you know, because they the pressure's not there, you know, and, and thing, life gets in the way and they're excited and then, you know, the semester gets in the way and it, they just, so, so uh, an automated 
I don't know, like an uh, automated email um, system that would feed from your pipeline that says, follow up with these authors on this date. And you could just, you know, just sort of a, how are things coming? And um, that, uh, that and recruiting were the most time consuming things so far. Um, editing is, uh, well, frankly, I'm not doing much of that. Most of my editors <laughs> are doing that. Um, one, one thing I, I am a little bit concerned about, um, and actually, David, this would be, uh, um, I, I may reach out to you at some point on this. Um, the overarching, so, so where we have chapters with a single author, there is uh, cohesion, it, it all flows, it makes sense. But there are several chapters where we're going to have um, several, you know, uh, eight authors for a single chapter, each writing different sections. And so connecting those and creating a flow and um, that'll really be a challenge. And um, I was planning to write introductions for those pieces. But see, this is the thing. The textbook is finally all claimed. I think we've been working on this for two years and we have one chapter completely out and a section is also completely out. And we have lots of things in, uh, in the content editing process and that seems to be fairly smooth. Um, but yeah, that, that so, so for David, the, the piece about trying to build um, consistency there uh, with, with language. And I, I really liked what you were talking about, not using synonyms, using the same key terms over and over because students will easily get confused. Um, uh, anyway, those are my thoughts there. On yeah, two. so quick question. What's the level of student that you're doing with these multiple authors? Just freshmen. Okay, so uh, the first thing I would say is, so addressing Karen's question about developmental editing, the very first thing that I would say is, so contributed works are excellent, and, and that's multiple author works, 